looking into the preamble of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now in the preamble we find this paragraph here, realizing that the individual, having duties to other individuals and to the community to which he belongs, is under a responsibility to strive for the promotion and observance of the rights recognized in the present covenant. So here the International Covenant, right, is putting the obligation and the duty upon who? Upon who? Upon you and me as individuals, right? And it goes on to say that we're under a responsibility to strive for the promotion and observance of the rights, of our fundamental rights. Well, why would we have to strive for the promotion and observance of them? Well, because our state party denies them, right? Our state party is trying to hide them, right? And it's up to us to strive and to teach individuals that they have inalienable rights, that they have absolute rights, that they have natural rights, wherein with the state party is obligated to allow them to exercise these rights. And if we don't do our part, right, and if we don't strive to teach others and teach those who we see in our own individual and personal world, then these rights will continue to be hidden. These rights will continue to be limited and abridged because people are not aware that they have them. Looking into the Constitution of Russia, Article 17, Subsection 2, Fundamental human rights and freedoms are inalienable and shall be enjoyed by everyone since the day of birth. All right, so we learned through the Constitution of Russia, right? We learned the operation of law. We learned what law declares, right? That fundamental human rights, they are inalienable. And you have these rights since the day of birth. Since the day you came onto this earth, you have a set of rights that belong to you just because of who you are. And when you look deeper, right, we understand that these rights are not given to us by the state party. These rights are not given to us by our countries. These rights belong to us and they can never be limited or abridged. In truth and in fact, right, if they're absolute rights and they're inalienable rights, then by the very definition of them, they are never to be limited or abridged. So we should be able to find this corresponding operation of law or this corresponding truth within our domestic law. This statement of fact. The fact being what? That we have rights that are never to be limited and abridged. Here we're looking into Canadian Emergencies Act. We're looking into the preamble. This enactment here is supposed to be an operation when the government declares it to be an operation during a time of emergency when there's a national emergency transpiring in the country or the corporate body, then they invoke this Emergencies Act, like we saw during what transpired recently in Ottawa. And here in the third paragraph, look what it says. And whereas the governor and council, in taking such special temporary measures, would be subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the Canadian Bill of Rights, and must have regard to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, particularly with respect to those fundamental rights that are not to be limited or abridged even in a national emergency. So here we see the operation of law, right? Here we see the truth of what's transpiring. There are fundamental rights that are not to be limited or abridged, even in a national emergency. Those are your inalienable rights. Those are your natural rights. Now, the legislators for Canada wrote up this enactment, and they included this paragraph therein. So that tells us and that shows us what? That Canada, the corporate body, or if you want to still refer to Canada as a country, that Canada and the powers that be are aware they are plenty aware of the fact that there are fundamental rights that each individual, man or woman, have, which cannot be limited or abridged, never. 
Never, ever, ever. I want you to notice something. Something specific here in this enactment. When they talk about never limiting or abridging, what is it that they refer to? When you look back into the sentence, right? It says, with respect to those fundamental rights, not fundamental freedoms, only fundamental rights. And it's as I've shared with you before, fundamental freedoms and fundamental rights are different in law. A freedom right must be granted to you. Granted to you. A right is something you already possess. That's why when they're talking about here concerning limitations or abridgments in the time of national emergency, they only refer to fundamental rights and not freedoms. And when you look into the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Article 2, right, we understand that all of those fundamental freedoms are subjected to a limitation. The courts have said it. The courts have already judged this. And Article 1 of the Charter falls against Article 2 because those are fundamental freedoms. So if you try to use Article 2 to defend a fundamental freedom, you can risk falling short. You can risk losing your case. Why? Well, because if an operation of law exists that allows them to limit the fundamental freedom, then they're not doing something wrong against you. But realize that those are not your fundamental rights. Those are your fundamental freedoms. And yes, when you read what is enumerated in the Constitution Act, Article 2, concerning your fundamental freedoms, you can say, well, hey, these should be rights also. And yes, they are. They are rights also. But if you choose to exercise them as a freedom, then they can be limited. But if you choose to exercise them as a right under Article 7 of the Constitution Act of 1982, then they can never be limited or abridged. But because most people don't understand the difference between a fundamental right and a fundamental freedom, they stand on fundamental freedoms and not their fundamental rights. I want to make an interjection here. And, and I want to read this for those who are still following an improper operation of law and are going to wind up getting themselves in trouble. There are many, many articles free to read on the internet and jurisprudences from the court free to read on the internet that talks about the Canadian Bill of Rights. And here's one of them. The Canadian Bill of Rights was the country's first federal law to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms. And there it, is, there it is again, right? Human rights and what? And fundamental freedoms. Two different subjects in law. Look at it as two different players in law. It was considered groundbreaking when it was enacted by the government of John Diefenbaker in 1960. But it proved too limited and ineffective, mainly because it applies only to federal statutes and not provincial ones. Well, there's more reasons than that, but they're providing you a reason here. Many judges regarded it as a mere interpretive aid. The bill was cited in 35 cases between 1960 and 1982. 30, 30 were rejected by the courts. Though it is still in effect the Bill of Rights was superseded by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982. And I'll make a second interjection here. The courts have already ruled that the rights found and protected in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms cannot be found in the Bill of Rights and cannot be used from the Bill of Rights. We're looking into the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 4. Here it writes, In the time of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, the state parties to the present covenant may take measures derogating from their obligations under the present covenant to the extent strictly required 
by the situation. So here, the covenant is saying that in a time of emergency, that there can be limitations and abridgments placed upon certain freedoms that have been enumerated and listed in the covenant themselves. Now notice it doesn't say that they can take measures removing their responsibilities from rights and freedoms. It doesn't say that. It just says from their obligations. Well, why would the writer do that? Why wouldn't the writer say, well, you can take measures against certain rights and freedoms or against rights and freedoms? They don't say that. Why? Well, because they don't want you to know. That's why it's written this way. They don't want you to know that they can't take measures against your fundamental rights. So they enumerate it and they write it in a way that they're not expressing what, is it, what it is exactly that the state parties can do. But when we look into, into the Emergencies Act in Canada, right, we see exactly what it's trying to say, right? Yeah, you can limit and abridge certain, certain things that are in the covenant, but not all things, not all. And the rights that are found in the covenant that are not subjected to a limitation and an abridgment are the same rights that you express in the Emergencies Act in Canada, wherein you say that even during a time of emergency, there are certain rights that are never to be limited and abridged. And let's look at one in specific. Let's look at one here in, in the Covenant specifically. In Article 16 of the Covenant, before we look at that article in the International Covenant, Article 16, let's look back in Article 17 of the Russian Constitution. And look what it says here. In the Russian Federation, recognition and guarantee shall be provided for the rights and freedoms of man and citizen according to the universally recognized principles and norms of international law and according to the present Constitution. So, the universally recognized principles and norms of international law are the international covenants. Plus, plus. But for, night, for tonight, the international covenants. And look back in that sentence, right? Look at the subject and the players that are being brought forth. The rights of freedoms of man and citizen. So the Russian Constitution is saying that there are rights and freedoms of man and citizen found in the international covenants. Well, we know man, right, is man. And citizen, well, what is a citizen? It's a person in law right? It's a statutory creature, right? We can go a bit deeper and say, well, a citizen is also controlled or has duties or comes under the Citizenship Act. See, it's a statutory creature, therefore it's controlled by a statutory law. And in law, it's a person. So now, with that in mind, let us jump into Article 16 of the ICCPR. Now remember, this is one of the rights that can never be limited or abridged even during a time of emergency. We just saw it in Article 4 above. So everyone shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. How many players, how many subjects are in this article of law? When they use the word everyone, who are they referring to? Are they referring to man or to citizen? Are they referring to man or person? Everyone here represents the human being. Everyone here represents the man or the woman. Now the operation of law or the principle of law here says that the man shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. All right, I've already taught and shared, right, that everywhere in our state party's country, everywhere that we operate within this state party's territory, right, we are treated as a person before the law. You get in your car, you're a driver. You go to school, you're a student. You go shopping, you're a consumer. You go to the hospital, you're a patient. 
you're out there fishing, you could you're considered sports fishing or a fisherman. You out you're out there hunting, you're considered a hunter. So this verse of law is this verse or this article of law here is teaching us already that there's recognition as a person everywhere before the law. In all aspects of the law, we can be recognized as a person. But does it produce an obligation? It doesn't. Because it's presented to us as a right. It says everyone or the man shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person. The state party wants to force you into recognition everywhere as a state as a person. Every time they interact with you, they're trying to interact with you as a person before the law. Everywhere before the law, you're a person to them. But your fundamental right says that you as a man or woman, you can exercise the right to recognition as a person. Not be forced to take recognition as a, a person and not be treated as that statutory creature or as that person. And this, this right, can never, ever be limited and abridged. So in essence, we can reconstruct this article of law to say it the same as we find it in the Quebec Civil Code, right? Where every human being or every man possesses a juridical personality. There's a distinction between what the man possesses and what the man is. So the man or the human being possesses a juridical person or possesses a person. Well, you possess a car, right? Do you use it all the time? You possess a bed, right? Are you in it all the time? No, right? You only use your car when you choose to use it. You only use your bed when you choose to use it. And it's the same thing here. You have the right to use or you have the right to be recognized as a person before the law, but you have no obligation. No obligation. And so what's the big problem here then? Some judges love this verse, this article of law here. Some lawyers love this article of law here because they don't see the problem they're in. They don't see the problem with it. When you force someone to take recognition as a person before the law, not only are you breaching their fundamental, absolute, natural right, but you're also limiting and abridging other rights. Because that statutory creature that you're forcing the man or woman to operate as or under has limited rights or limited freedoms. That person, that statutory creature, cannot operate under a full legal capacity. It's operating through statutory power with certain rights and freedoms, with certain obligations and duties. And therein lies the problem, right? Because it's a limitation and abridgment against a fundamental right, first and foremost, to force anybody into recognition as a person before the law and then to further, further limit and abridge their fundamental rights through the enactments, through the statutory powers. So here we're looking into the Quebec Civil Code. Article 1, and it says every human being, every man, every woman possesses juridical personality and has the full enjoyment of civil rights. So they make a qualification, right? The full enjoyment of what? Civil rights. Not fundamental rights, not human rights, not natural rights but civil rights. And here, the human being, law is teaching us, possesses juridical personality. Well, if you possess it, right, then you can use it. If you possess it, then you can enter into recognition as the juridical personality. But whose choice is it? Whose decision is it if they're going to enter or use what they possess? Well, international law says it's our choice, right? And when you understand absolute natural rights, it's our choice, right? No one else's. 
the Quebec Civil Code, Article 4, every person is fully able to exercise his civil rights. So we know that there's a human being or a man and there's a person in operation in, this, in these laws, right? But here, when the article of law is talking about exercising civil rights, what subject is it attached to? Is it attached to the man? Or is it, is it attached to the person, the statutory creature, the juridical personality? It's attached to the statutory creature, right? To the person. So when they come after you for taxation, right? They're coming after you under the guise of civil responsibilities, civil duties, civil rights, and they're coming after what? A juridical personality, right? A person in the law, right? The resident, the taxpayer. When they say you are a driver and they want to issue you a ticket, the same operation of law is transpiring. They're declaring that you are operating civil rights, civil duties, civil responsibilities. And as the statutory creature, as the person, you are exercising these rights. And therefore, they can be regulated, limited, or abridged. But what we need to take mental note of and really see with clarity in the law is that civil rights are exercised by persons by statutory creatures, not by men and women, not by human beings. Quebec Civil Code, Article 8. A person may only renounce the exercise of his civil rights to the extent consistent with public order. So here we're learning, right, that it's possible to renounce the exercise of civil rights you can say, I am not exercising civil rights. I refuse to exercise civil rights. You can renounce the exercise of civil rights. But when you do so, it has to be consistent with public order. It has to be consistent with proper operations of law, with proper principles of fundamental justice. And we know, right, that to be consistent with public order, there's some things that you have to do, right? You have to prove you have the right. You have to prove the state party is under obligation to respect and ensure that right. And then you have to prove or be aware of how they limited and abridged your fundamental right. And when you have all three of that down pat, so to speak, then you can renounce the exercise of your civil rights. Does it take a court order to renounce the exercise of your civil rights? No, it doesn't, right? The courts have already ruled, right? That if a statutory power limits and abridges one of your natural rights, one of your fundamental rights, one of your inalienable rights, then it doesn't take a court order to provide a remedy for you. What does it take? Well, it takes your knowledge, first and foremost. You have to be able to express the fact that I know that there's an obligation on the state party because of international law to respect my natural right. And my natural right has been limited and abridged. And I'll show you where they tried or they did limit and abridge it in the statutory power. And because you can express that, right, then what you're doing is exercising your fundamental human rights. You're exercising them. You're renouncing your civil rights and you're standing on your fundamental rights that you were born with. Now, if the state party pushes the point against you, if the executive powers push the point against you and try to force you to exercise civil rights as a statutory creature, as a person, and try to yoke you to a statutory law, well, you're able to defend your position. Why? Because you know who you are in the law. And you might have to. The, the, the way this state party is wicked, the way this state party uses written law and statutory powers 
to bind up, to restrict, and to control men and women. It shows us that it's an evil system. It doesn't care about us, right? The laws they create fine us and take away from us. They say you owe taxes, right? And they put a lien on your house. And they seize your bank accounts. And they put judgments upon your credit and judgments upon your home. Why does it do that? Because the law is wicked and the law is evil and it's being used to harm and to take and to steal from you. That's what it's doing. And if you're too blind and if you can't see, well, I feel sorry for you. You want to love the law. You want to exalt the law. Well, you're exalting wickedness. That's what you're doing. Oh yeah, but the criminal code, it, it helps mankind. And I didn't, didn't say common law. I didn't say natural rights and freedoms. I said these civil rights that legislators are creating, that are limiting and restricting and abridging fundamental rights and yoking the people with burdens that are too heavy to carry. That's the wickedness of this law. And you support it. And you embrace it. And you represent it before the courts. Your heart's not clean. Your heart is dirty. Russian Constitution, Article 18. The rights and freedoms of man and citizen shall be directly operative. Directly operative. Does it say you need a court order to operate them? Does it say you need someone's permission to operate them? No, right? And I know this is the Russian constitution, but it's teaching us the operations of law that are actually in existence out there, but we're unaware of them. It says the rights of man are what? Directly operative. So when we transfer that into Canadian law, right, and we look at the Canadian courts, and the courts have declared, well, it doesn't take a court judgment in order for you to exercise your rights. If the statutory power is limiting and abridging your fundamental human right, your natural right, your inalienable right, Well, you don't need me, the court, to do anything for you. Why? Well, because they're supposed to be directly operative in law. I'm supposed to be allowed to operate them in law. But you know what? The state party is evil. Again, I say it. Why? Because they step in front of you. And they want to stop you from operating your rights. When you wake up to what's transpiring to you personally, then instead of allowing you to operate your rights... They stand in your way and they say, no, we won't let you go. We want you to play the role of the statutory creature. We want to force you as recognition in law as a person so we can remain in control of you, so we can restrict and control your actions. And that is a total violation of the fundamental principles of law. And it says that these rights and freedoms of man, they determine the essence, meaning, and implementation of laws. The activities of legislative and executive authorities. Well, I guess our legislative body here in Canada and our executive authorities never understood these operations of law. Or they did, right? They did, and they just ignored them. Because of why? Oh, because they're so nice. Because they're kind and gentle. No, because it's evil. Because it is evil. That is why they did it. Because they want to control people. Because they want to have control over people with words on paper. And they're doing it. And after saying all that, I close this video reading the preamble of the ICCPR once again. Considering the obligation of the states under the Charter of the United Nations to promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and freedoms. So, the states, Canada, have the obligation to promote respect and allow us to observe our human rights. And realizing that the individual, you and me, having duties to other individuals and to the community to which he belongs, is under a responsibility to strive for the promotion and observance of the rights recognized in the present covenant. Well, what the heck in the world is going on here now? If you understand English, if you understand words, 
if you understand the way they can construct sentences, then when I just read this to you, you should be flipping in your chair. You should be. Why are we under a responsibility to have to strive? To have to strive for the promotion and observance of the rights. If the state party is under the obligation to promote, respect, and allow for observance of our rights, why in the next paragraph are you telling me that in order for me to exercise my rights, I'm going to have to strive for it? I'm going to have to strive for it. And further to that, it's my responsibility, not the state parties. It says, I am under a responsibility to strive for the promotion and observance of these rights. Hey, when I strive for them, right? When I try to promote them and observe them, this evil state party and the executive powers and the disgusting lawyers that represent the state party are trying to deny the rights, are trying to destroy the rights. And this is going on in our country. And people are asleep at the wheel. And people have their head under a pillow and have no idea what's transpiring. 